I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, firstly, by the encouragement that I heard from around this table to hear so many real good friends who are trying to help us in our hour of need. I also feel somewhat humbled coming after the last two speakers who are obviously two experts in their field and extremely knowledgeable and came with a clearly organized program. As I said, I'm overwhelmed and somewhat confused. I've heard such a wealth of, of information from various different viewpoints, <coughs> theological, political, economic, all of which somehow come together. <clears throat> and as I said when I was first invited to this uh, distinguished quorum, I really don't think I'm the right address to address this group of people. But I would like to recall some recollections, recollections which precede the Durban fiasco. Many years ago, I was a member of an organization called ARC, Alliance of Religions and Conservation, which was founded by the Duke of Edinburgh as a sort of offshoot of the World Wildlife Fund, WWF as it was then called. And there was um, a meeting hosted by the Duke at Buckingham Palace in which members of ARC, and ARC was represented by 14 different individuals who represented 14 different religions, including Zoroastrians and other somewhat more obscure religions. And each one spoke briefly before the Queen and the Duke and other distinguished persons. And I had heard that the same day the TUC, which is the Trade Union Congress, which was the largest trade union organization in Britain, was considering a boycott of certain Israeli products, including the caterpillar story. And I got up and said, it's very ironic that today, which is the Holocaust Day, Yom HaShoah, celebrated in Israel, is the day that the TUC is considering boycotting us. And isn't this just a continuation of British mandatory Christian anti-Semitism? And I turned to the Duke and I asked him, to use his influence. Whether he did or he didn't, I don't know. But that particular incentive <laughs> fell by the wayside. Ark then developed another organization called 3IG. The argument being that the churches and not just the churches, but all faith religions have tremendous economic potential. Just to give you an example, 20 years ago, the pension fund of the United Methodist Church in the United States was $17 billion. That's just one little example of the power, of the economic power of faith groups. And there existed in, and there still exists, a central committee of 
in America, and a similar one in Canada and Australia, of um, church funds, and they were united in an an attempt to develop a socially um, a, uh, that developed in other directions. It began as an ethical investment policy, then it became a socially responsible investment policy. So ethics turned into social responsibility. Ethics is something religious. That's how people were thinking at the time. If you wanted to go beyond the churches, into the banks, into the NGOs, you spoke about socially um, socially uh, investment, social investment, so responsible investment policies. And at the time, as a member of ARC 3IG, we were in constant contact with these large inter-church, inter-NTO organizations who were members of the, um, this particular organization, 3IG. And one of the things that we, I, we, had to constantly struggle against, or struggle for, was the de definitions of ethical or social resp socially responsible investment. Now, social responsible investment or ethical investment also has its reverse die, which is divestment. If you have a large sum of money which is invested in an investment company, you can control the policy of that investment company, of that investment bank, um, in a, by voting or by proxy voting. And therefore, you have a very powerful mechanism for controlling those large economic bodies. You don't have to boycott capital, uh, Caterpillar. You can use your own shares in the company through proxy voting to change the whole policy of the company. So the question that we were struggling with is how we define ethical or socially responsible investment and how we separate that from politics. And we were there dealing mainly with the churches primarily with churches. And here, as I think one of the four former speakers said, it was personal relationships between the individuals sitting around the table that was of primary importance in formulating policy. So, much can be done at ground roots and by monitoring and by publishing and by exposing. At the same time, I think there has to be an attempt to penetrate at higher levels the key organizations which control, to a large extent, funding in various different directions. Narrative 
is something that is very difficult to struggle against. Recently, there was a State Department project for examining um, textbooks in Israel and in the um, Palestinian schools as to how the other is presented. And hundreds of textbooks were carefully examined, both in Hebrew and in Arabic, by scholars, both Jewish, Muslim, and Christians. And there was an oversight committee of an international body, including scholars from Germany, from France, from Sweden, etc. And various key words or key notions were examined. The argument being that you cannot create better relationships between Israelis and Palestinians in the area of the Holy Land, and I don't want to defi define the Holy Land because according to the Anglican Church, Cyprus and southern Turkey also belongs to the Holy Land. I agree, but <laughs> it's not the normal political division that we know about. Um, we have to take into account how these young children are taught, what they're taught about the other. And we had a meeting well, six or seven months ago in Washington where we met with the Vice President Biden, with Hillary, with Panetta and others, and brought our initial findings. And the initial findings were that the narrative which is taught in the two school systems is so different that even with the same basic historical facts, the total impression are diametrically opposed to one another. It's going to be very difficult to change these textbooks. Even taking into account, even if it were the case that the historical facts were <coughs> correct in both cases, the interpretations were so different that the pictures came out directly opposed, diametrically opposed. And diametrically opposed meaning the sort of narratives that engender mutual hatred. Again, it's very difficult to fight against narrative. We have to present a different narrative as was stated so clearly by our former speaker. A completely different picture of what's going on. Not so long ago, there was a massive synod of Catholic priests that took part in the Vatican. And prior to that, there was a working statement called the Lineamenta, which was passed on to me for examination and notes. And there was much that was false. There was much that was incorrect. Whether consciously or not, I don't know. And we amended these mistakes, and the emendations were accepted. And a final document was called the Instrumentum Opus, which was then brought to the Vatican, and which dealt with the state of, the, of Christianity within the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. Again, 
had there not been these emendations made from a, an external source, I think the picture of the final decisions of the synod would be very diff different. The actual document has not yet been ratified by the Pope. He doesn't have to ratify it, but if he does, it'll be much more positive than it would have been had it not been amended. In a similar example, again not so long ago, I was invited to Lambeth Palace to a meeting which was unique in that it was hosted by both the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of Westminster, that is to say an Anglican and a Catholic working together, on the status of the Christian's church in the Holy Land. And here I learned that Cyprus was also a part of the Holy Land and certain parts of Turkey. And um, Palestinians were invited to tell their story, young students, very heart-rending stories, extremely one-sided, probably honest, probably accurate, but certainly not representative of the situation. These were Christians, Christian Arabs. Information was presented on the demographic developments of the Christian church in the Holy Land. And the Christian church was not just Catholic and Anglican, it was also um, other denominations. And um, it was only because these misleading statements were again amended and more accurate statistics were presented, whether they were believed or not by other members of the uh, meeting or not, I don't know, but they were certainly accurate. Again, the, ta the final decisions, whether they were meaningful or not, I don't know, were certainly far more positive than they would have been otherwise. So while I applaud all the various efforts that are being made on the part of so many different and other parts of the world, I still accept the statement that was made by one of the former speakers that uh, personal relationships have a tremendously positive effect. Well-placed individuals can really bring about a major change in global developments. Maybe this is naivety, but maybe sometimes one has to have vision. As a religious person, and all of us here are religious. We know that the prime mover for any sort of movement, the energy, has to come from visionaries. It has to come from people of faith who believe that their passion can have remarkable effect. Sometimes the effect is disastrous. It's our job to see that the effect is positive. Once again, I wish to thank every one of you for everything that you're doing for us. And I think it's very important that what you're doing should be known to us so that we can really fully appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.